that under the Lorentz transformations between two inertial frames, which say moves with constant velocity with respect to one, <coughs> this is the set of coordinates x and set of coordinates x prime and the psi of x and psi prime of x prime is the spinner as <coughs> measured by the k prime. So let's put it up so that these things do not mix up. We have carried out the Lorentz transformation with lambda and this one with s of lambda. Lambda depends only just the parameters of the rotations and boosts and S is a function of the lambda itself because this is the one which implements the transformation in the spinor space. And we have parameterized <coughs> the lambda as such omega is the parameter and lambda is sort of a <coughs> unit matrix, so-called unit I'll explain what that means, unit matrix, okay. It's going to, actually they are the gener generators of the generators of the boosts and the pure rotations, <coughs> okay. Then, in this parameterization, that is with the sign plus up there, we have constructed S and we have found that it has the following form, I over 4, omega, sigma mu nu, lambda mu nu. The signs are consistent the way we have parameterized it. And we have determined the S through an equation of that form we have solved this equation and determined the S as above and the sigma mu nu coming out of this is I over two. Let me always work out with the contravariant indices. So these are all, these were all determined. <coughs> that is the a form of the sigma menu and the S which actually does the transformation so that the primed equation has the same form as the unprimed equation. That is the, the Dirac equation is covariant, has the same form. In a sense, the requirement of covariance enabled us to construct the S or the underlying equation, this equation and the solution S in that form. So we are, uh, with that we have really finished the discussion of constructing the Dirac equation. We have constructed it, we have, we have demonstrated that it's consistent with the energy momentum relations it has the well-defined probabilistic interpretation because it satisfies a continuity equation. Now it is proven to be covariant. And these gammas satisfy a very nice algebra called the Clifford algebra. And gammas have the following representation. Gamma I super sigma i minus sigma i and the gamma zero was beta already so there is no change. Fine. So what we have to do next is <clears throat> work out a few cases specifically <clears throat> 
that is explicit transformations. We are going to construct them now, transformations. Both in the Lorentz space and in the Spinor space. Now let's try to <coughs> construct the explicit form of the explicit forms of the lambda. We have seen that the basic principle of the relativity is the invariance of the infinitesimal interval, which was g mu nu dx mu dx nu. Really, this is the invariant interval. And this sort of uh, tells us everything about the Lorentz transformation. If you r write the invariance in the form, then using the, <coughs> relating the prime coordinates to the unprimed ones through this relationship in the tensor notation, you get an expression for the lambda written in the matrix notation, it reads as follows. G's are the metric tensors. There's this metric mu nu in the matrix notation is denoted as such. Now, the G matrix are the ones which corresponds to the mu nu or super mu nu tensors that both at the same level. However, the lambda matrix is associated with the one index up, one index down. So this is the matrix correspondences. And you can find also the transpose. The transpose is obviously when the two indices are interchanged. So it automatically, this automatically follows from this invariance. And you can also solve these using the, this uh, exponential parameterization. We can find a relationship for the lambda in the matrix notation. And then we'll know what are the ones corresponding to pure boost and what are the ones corresponding to pure rotations. Notice that I'm sort of trying to give a descriptive explanation because last time I have done it in a more a uh, difficult manner. I have demonstrated that as a tensor, this little lambda is anti-symmetric, remember? And I was using the very complicated alternative proof using the tensor notation. We can repeat the same in here easily, but let's, de let's demonstrate it again that lambda mu nu, we have shown to be lambda nu mu, which followed from this, again, these relations in the tensor form of it, you remember we have done a very nice demonstration of it. Can we repeat the same proof in this simpler matrix notation? It's not too difficult. Let's do that quickly so that we can have a rather nice feeling about it. How do I do that? Lambda, capital lambda is denoted as such. All these parameters are factors, so that the, the, the little lambda involves ones only. That's the reason why I call it sort of unit matrix, involving ones, nothing else. But you need parameters, right? You need thetas for the rotations. You need velocity parameters for the velocity or beta, B over C parameters for the boost anyway. Doesn't matter. So if this is the expression, how do I really use that matrix equation to determine the anti-symmetric property of the lambda, which will enable me to write what the actual independent generators are quickly. So what is, what is the form of the equation which follows from here immediately? Let's do the following. Let's multiply this equation from right by the inverse of lambda. as a first step, and then by, by g once more from the right, 
So you have this G lambda inverse G relationship. It's equivalent to this one directly. It is a little more aesthetical because it tells you the relationship between the transpose and the inverse of lambda. If it was an ordinary three-dimensional Euclidean space, and if you were talking about the ordinary Euclidean transformations describing the rotations, you would be having R transpose equal to R inverse. They were purely orthogonal. And this is obviously the general generalization of it to the four-dimensional Minkowski space, which is not Euclidean. And there is an indefinite, indefinite metric, G. So it's a beautiful relationship, but that, that's not the point. As I said, my uh, purpose is not to teach you Lorentz group. We have to just quickly use and get some consequences of it so that I can work out the explicit form of these for the specific case of boosts and rotations rather quickly. So how do I uh, solve this in terms of this parameterization? I have to just take the lambda inverse from there. Perhaps I can do it next to it. Lambda inverse is just e to the minus omega lambda, right? That's the inverse, obviously. Now what about the transpose? To get the transpose, I will describe it in plain words instead of doing all those, instead of writing all the details of the steps. What is the meaning of this exponential operator? It's an infinite series, right? Power series. You expand it as one plus omega lambda plus omega squared over two factorial lambda squared, etc., etc. It's an infinite series. That's the meaning of this representation. Then you take the transpose of the left-hand side, meaning take the transpose of the each term in the right-hand side. Then it's one, transpose of one is one, plus omega lambda transpose, plus omega squared lambda transpose squared. Then you resum. So what you get? Okay, so that's really the expression. Okay, so if I now bring this expression down in here, it is omega lambda transpose is equal to G lambda inverse G. Well, perhaps, let's put the, excellent, the actual expression, although it's a trivial, trivial step. Let's put it there. How do I work this out? Again, you expand this into infinite power series expansion. There's one minus omega lambda, etc., and plus the square omega squared over two times g lambda squared g. Then you, exponentiate you expand multiply each term from left and right by g and then resum obviously it is the g lambda g which raised up then you equate both and both sides what do you get lambda transpose is equal to minus g lambda g nice isn't it that is the sort of definition of the transpose of this lambda element of the algebra. Now you again write this, say, from left by g, multiply this by g from left, so it is g lambda transpose is equal to minus lambda g. Now you convert this, or actually I can write it from right for aesthetic reasons. Obviously, they are all equivalent to each other. So what do I have? Lambda transpose G is equal to minus G lambda, lambda, G lambda, because G squared is one. That's the property of this G. And perhaps I should write it to emphasize that this G is such that it is, it immerses itself, so that square is one. So what do I have in here? I have, what I have in here is G lambda transpose is minus G lambda. Okay. Indeed G lambda is as a matrix. 
G lambda is anti-symmetric. So let me write it in plain English. G lambda matrix is anti-symmetric. You may wonder, is this consistent with that? Let's check. These are the tensor expression that when both indices are down or up, that is the anti-symmetry we have demonstrated in the tensor notation. In the matrix notation, this is the anti-symmetry we have demonstrated. What is the G lambda matrix then? Let me write the G lambda matrix in tensor notation. What is it? G mu rho lambda rho nu. Because we know that the matrix convention that I have introduced, please pay attention, is that G matrices, G matrices are either both indices are down or up, whereas the lambda matrices are defined with the first index is up, second index is down. That's the convention, right? which we have defined. The same is true. If it is true for the capital lambda, it's true for the algebra because you expand it and you demonstrate that each terms have that correspondence. So what is it really, this now? What is the, in the tensor notation, this G lambda? You bring this index down or you bring this index down with the help of me. You see? This is, this lambda matrix has that tensor correspondence. Indeed, then, this being anti-symmetric is the same as the previous proof. Fine. So, how do I parameterize an anti-symmetric matrix now? That's the G lambda matrix. It is anti-symmetric, right? And it's ordinary four by four matrix form. So how do I write that? You see, it's a funny notation, but it's a very safe notation. So we have to be know what we are talking about. It is a very specifically defined matrix. Therefore, I write a G lambda matrix. It is an ordinary 4 by 4 matrix, satisfying the matrix multiplication algebra. But these are the elements of it are when the both are down, both are up, they are just tensors, second rank tensors, which is anti-symmetric second rank. So this matrix is also anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric matrices have diagonal element zero, right? Can we demonstrate that? If A is an anti-symmetric matrix, any matrix, MN, if it is anti-symmetric NM, what are the diagonal elements when both M and R N are the same? That is A M M is equal to minus A M M. A M M is equal to zero. Anti-symmetric matrices are such that their diagonal elements are zero. Fine. Here are the positions. Obviously, this is the conventional uh, notation. I separate out the zeroth component, which is the time. The rest are the space indices. This three by three block are the pure space matrix. So I know that these are zero. Zero. And what about the other elements? Whatever I have in there, the, the, there are the minuses of them, right? So if you want, you can say what kind of notations we can use. We can use, for instance, mm, let me invent a notation. Lambda L11, L1, L01. L02, L03. This is L10, which is due to the anti-symmetry. This is the minus L01, minus L02, minus L03. And what about the space parts? Again, these are anti-symmetric. Whatever these elements are, they are going to be the minuses. So if I write this as L12, L13 and L23, and this is going to be minus L12, minus L13, and minus L23. Here is a nice 
parameterization. I have a 4x4 anti-symmetric matrix and automatically it contains how many parameters? Three in here, three in there, six. Six parameters. Three of them correspond, hopefully, to the boosts. That's Lorentz boost. The other three correspond to the pure rotations. That's the space part. So obviously it's going to be related to the space rotations, pure space rotations. But I'm really not done with the matrix yet. I will finish it in a moment. Then perhaps it is safe to talk about it. As these mix the zeros component with the space ones, these row, that row or that column correspond to the boosts, pure Lorentz boosts. What do I say? I say it's a G lambda matrix yet. Not the lambda matrix, G lambda matrix yet. So what is the lambda matrix then? Lambda matrix, please bear with my strange notation, but it's rigorous and you cannot make a mistake with that notation because it describes everything. Lambda matrix is G matrix times the G lambda matrix, correct? Why? Because there is a G lambda in here, G here, G squared is identity. So when you multiply the G lambda matrix with the G matrix, you get the lambda matrix. So if this is the G lambda matrix, if I multiply this with the G, what do I get? I get just that and that become the same. Because of the G being 1, minus 1, minus 1, and minus 1, convert this column to the same sign, but these stay anti-symmetric yet. It's not affected by the multiplication of the G. So lambda matrix then, I can write. It is a 4x4 four four matrix, therefore I really write the matrix, expecting that it's going to obey the matrix multiplication rules. Now I guess I, guess I can use the safe notation now. The zeros are the same because multiplication of the G do not affect these zeros. They, these zeros stay as zeros. <coughs> and these terms are the same. Lambda 0, 1. Now I use lambdas. Like you're going to do the clean notation. Lambda 0, 3. Lambda 0, 1. Those are the same now after the multiplication. Lambda 0, 3. And lambda 1, 2, lambda 1, 3, lambda 2, 3, minus lambda 1, 2, minus lambda 1, 3, minus lambda 2, 3 is my matrix now. Notice the signs. This matrix is such that row, the zeros column and zeros row are the same. So anti-symmetry is retained in the space part but there is a symmetry in the zero the space and time uh, cross terms. Okay, so that's the form of the matrix. How do I write that mat matrix? I can write that matrix by paying attention to the, for example, what is the coefficient of the lambda zero one? Or what is the coefficient of the, let's call it K one. If I just look at the coefficient of the lambda zero one, everything else is not there. It, they, it, the K1 is a matrix which has one in here, one in there. If I look at the coefficients of lambda 0, 2, it's, it has, it's a matrix which has only one in here, one in here, all the rest are 0. And similarly, lambda 0. So I define, I denote those terms as K1, K2, and K3. K2 and K3. And also, I have other expressions. For example, looking at the coefficients of the lambda 1, 2. I have a 1 in here, minus 1 in here, all the rest are 0. So let's denote that, uh, let's denote that term as S3. 1, 2, 3. I'm going to using the cyclicity. So I, it's a notation. I'm defining them. So what about the lambda 1, 2, the coefficient of the lambda 1, 3 term? If you just look at the standard cyclicity, 1, 2, 3, you take all these signs to be positive. If it is 1, 3, probably it's going to be a minus 1. 
I can denote it as minus S3, S2, sorry. So that my definition agrees with the standard definition. And finally, it is 2, 3. There is a 2, 3 term. So that's a 0 if you can read it. 2, 3 is S1. So all of a sudden, I have these sort of unit matrices. Those matrices having only ones and zeros, nothing else. That's, that's the reason why I have introduced that key, omega to factor out the parameters. So let me write the K1, K2, and K3, and let's see what kind of transformations they are in the Lorentz space. And eventually, I will find the counterparts of them in the Spinor space. Okay, so what is K1? K1 is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Space part is all zeros. K2 is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. That's K2. And K3 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. You just read it from that parameterization. And let's read the S1, S2, and S3. The S1, which I have from there, is 1 and minus 1 in the space part. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Correct? I'm just reading it from here. 1 and minus 1. The second the coefficient of lambda 1, 3 is, there's a 1 in here, minus 1 in here, but I have defined it in such a way that the S2 is 1, 3, 2, so it's going to be minus 1 in here, plus 1 in here, okay? I could have defined the minus of it as S2, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's a convention which I'm introducing in here. 1, 3, I said let's use the cyclicity, so I put a minus sign in here, therefore the S2 should have a minus in there, plus in there. Which one? Which one? This one is lambda 2, 3. This one is lambda 1, 3. This one is wrong? This one is correct. And this one is correct? And this one? Okay, let me check. S3, ah, oh, that's S3, okay. This is what you are talking about, right? Okay, okay, it's the wrong label, S3, S2, and S1. The S1 is then 2, 3, so it is 1 and minus 1 in the 2, 3 positions. 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. Okay, that's the S1. Okay, correct. Now let's try to understand the meaning of the capital lambda 
when the lambdas, little lambdas are associated with any, with any one of them. For example, what are the, what is the lambda associated with the K1, for instance? Perhaps a better notation is this. Instead of writing as a function, it's not, it's a label. Using the notation that capital lambda and the little lambda are related as such. So if I, as my little lambda generator are the three K1, K3, Ks and three Ss, so I'm checking what is the lambda associated with the K1 or K2 or K3. Okay, let this work one of them out rather quickly. Let's see what, what we have. What is the meaning of this? The only thing we can say is that it's an infinite series expansion. That's all we know of. Notice that I am pursuing writing to higher orders because you see that the recursion relations will start coming in, involving all of them. So, I need, my K1 is known, what are the K1 squared and K1 cubed and K1 to the fourth. Let's write the K1, it's easy for, the K1 is rather aesthetically nice. I will write it in the following fa ma fashion, 0, 1, 1, 0 in the upper 0, 1 block. So I write this 4x4 four four block as the two in terms of the 2x2 two two blocks. The first because the only non-trivial part is this one, 0, 1 and 1, 0. Dealing with this is easy. What is the K1 squared? K1 squared is just everything happens in this upper block diagonal. It's the square of it is 1. 1 and 1, 0 and 0 and 0. So if I now multiply this with another k1 cube is k1 squared times k1, you take this here and that there. So you, what, what's happening is that this identity is multiplying that one, so giving you back you the same thing. So it becomes again 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0. So what is this now? It is back to the K1. So this is the recursion relation. Nice, isn't it? It is nice when you are dealing with one of them only. You can repeat the same argument for all the, K, the other K, the other Ks, which is K2 and K3 immediately. You can de demonstrate that cube of it is the same as the K1. If the cube is the same as K1, then K1 to the fourth is K1 squared. And k1 to the fifth is k1 cube again back to k1. So in this expansion, there are identities, k1s and k1 squareds. Let's write that down. So what do I have? Let me write it as identity plus omega k1 plus omega squared over 2 k1 squared plus omega cube over 3 factorial k1 plus omega to the 4 over 4 factorial k1 squared, etc. It goes in that manner, right? k1, k1 squared, k1, k1 squared. So we sort of feel how it is going now. There is the identity only. And there are the coefficients of the K1 terms, which is omega and plus omega cube over 3 factorial, plus obviously you feel it coming. If it is omega to the fifth, it's K1 to the cube, so linear K1. Omega to the fifth divided by 5 factorial. So this is the coefficient of the K1. What about the coefficients of the K1 squared? So it is omega squared over 2 factorial plus omega to the 4, 4 factorial 
etc. Omega total 6. So the first, so sorry, the second term is this sine hyperbolic of omega. That's I plus K1 sine hyperbolic omega. And this one is, if I add and subtract the 1, obviously it is the cosine hyperbolic minus 1. Okay, so I have more or less come to a stage that I can write this 4 by 4 matrix. I'm still writing a matrix. So what is that 4 by 4 matrix, which is this one I'm writing, right? So there, there is the identity. Let me, just for the sake of simplicity, although in principle I write 1 and 3 separation, but for this K1 business there is a nice 2 by 2 blocks appearing, right, because of the form of the matrix. So this is the identity, the first one. What about the K1 sine hyperbolic term? Again, I go to that 2 by 2, 0 sine hyperbolic omega, sine hyperbolic omega 0, zeros in here, And then the K1 squared. K1 squared is identities in here, right? So it is, again, writing this 2 by 2 block cosine hyperbolic omega minus 1, 0, 0, cosine hyperbolic omega minus 1, 0, 0, and 0. So it's easy to sum now. Everything takes place on, in the diagonal part. Essentially, notice that there is cosine hyperbolic minus 1 and there is a 1 in there. Those 1's cancel. Cosine hyperbolic minus 1 and 1, that, those 1's also cancel. And what I have is the following for this matrix. Cosine hyperbolic omega, that's the only term. And sine hyperbolic omega in these positions, in that position. And sine hyperbolic omega here, cosine hyperbolic omega here, zero, zero, here there are ones. So that's the matrix. The Lorentz matrix, lambda, capital lambda. So what, does, what kind of transformation it does? Let's check. Remember, I have x prime lambda x in the matrix notation. In the matrix notation, we denote the x, x's as x0 prime, x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime is equal to this lambda, which is cosine hyperbolic omega sine hyperbolic omega, sine hyperbolic omega, cosine hyperbolic omega, 0, 1, and 1, times x0, x1, x2, x3. OK. So all the, at the end of the day, what is that? Notice that the 2 and 3, are not affected because 2 and 3 is multiplied by that identity. Let me write it on top. x2 prime is the same as x3, x2, x3 prime is the same as x3. And what about the rest? The rest is x0 prime cosine hyperbolic omega, or for aesthetic reasons, first x0 cosine hyperbolic omega plus x1 sine hyperbolic omega, x1 prime is x1 
x0 sine hyperbolic omega plus x1 cosine hyperbolic omega. So that's the transformation that I have obtained. Obviously, as the second and third coordinates are not affected, they are not changed, only the zero and one, for zero and first components mixed, that is the time and x, Cartesian x mixed. Obviously, this should be an x boost. There's a boost in the x direction, correct? How do I then relate this omega, the parameter, which is a mathematical parameter, to the physical ones? Let's remember the physical boost, which is obtained directly uh, without really referring to this Lorentz group, simply by using the invariance of the interval. And if you remember that, it is gamma x0 minus beta x1 and x1 prime is gamma x1 minus beta x0. It is this physical transformation as all of you know year back, years ago you have seen it in the, if not in the freshman physics, in the modern physics press, right? So if you compare this physical one and that the new one which I have obtained to using these Lorentz group of type of arguments, what do I see? I see the following sign. Now if you let's take the first one. Write it as cosine hyperbolic omega x0 plus x, x1 tangent hyperbolic omega, right? That is a more suggest, well similarly you can do the same in here. Then comparing these two equations, what you see is the following. Cosine hyperbolic omega is gamma, you know Einstein gamma, right? One over the square root of one minus beta squared. Let me write what that thing is. One minus beta squared to the minus a half, the famous Einstein gamma, and uh, it shows how fast the objects are moving. And the second is tangent hyperbolic omega is the minus the beta. Okay. So if I solve this, omega is tangent hyperbolic inverse of minus beta. Or if you want, you can take the minus out, minus the tangent hyperbolic inverse of beta. So indeed we have shown that this is a boost and this is how the mathematical parameters and the physical parameters, that boost parameters are related. And you can repeat the same along the y and along the z directions and reproduce the same formulas. All you have to do is just, you see here, physical boost is between x0 and x1. You can go x0 to x2 or x0 to x3 and go to the k2 and k3, repeat the same construction. You still end up having the same expressions. What I have to do next is go to the s's, the other three, which only have non-zero elements in the space part not the all zeros on the zero, the, the time and space-time cross terms. That I will do after the break and we'll, then we are going to move into the spin or space immediately.